right, everyone, welcome to our first installment. Uh, my name is Dr. Liliana Conles Gallegos, and um, we're going to try this out, see how it works. Uh, you let me know. Um, I'll be checking you guys and seeing like, how you're feeling. Um, we just passed the first module. This should be the second module, so we'll see like how we're doing. And then from there, we can modify what we're doing. You Please let me know. Um, Please post anything, any kind of thoughts or ideas in the frequently asked questions forum that is before you email me. That way it can become a community conversation. All right, guys, so let's start. So this week uh, we're going to be talking about Mexicanos, Mexicans, an introduction to the hidden histories of Mexico and USA relations. So Mexico is and has always been perceived as the closest gateway, uh, not only into Latin America, but into the entire so-called third world or developing world. Um, but is Mexico a third world country? Well, even though supposedly Mexico is not technically a third world country, economically speaking, um, unless you're defining third world by uh, the three worlds of the cold era, which I will explain right after this, as a country that was not aligned with the U.S. or the Soviet Union, uh, Mexico is, is the 14th largest economy in the world. It has health care. It has a robust manufacturing, export, and agricultural markets. But there is a catch, a catch to all this. Uh, most of the revenue or the money that's being made is sucked in by U.S. investors and U.S. companies. Uh, so let's try to see if we could tackle this step by step. So the third world, the term third world, arose during the Cold War to define countries that remained non-aligned with either NATO or the communist bloc. That is, the United States, Western European nations, and their allies, those guys represented the first world, while the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, and their allies represented the second world. But economically, it came to mean something else, right? What? Well... The use of the terms first, second, and third world is a rough, and it's safe to say, outdated model of the geopolitical world from the time of the Cold War. Um, the Cold War was a state of political tension between World War II when the United States, I mean, sorry, after World War II when the United States and Western Europe lived in fear that the dark side, uh, aka second world countries, would come and attack us and try to take over the world. You know, people still uh, talk about the communists today um, to, to talk about fears of like losing what we have and being taken over. Uh, during this time, you know, the nations also competed for influence around the world. And it was called the Cold War because no actual weapons were fired. So it was a war, but not in the traditional sense of the term. And honestly, there's no official definition of first, second, and third world. Um, so there is actually a fourth world. And this is how the World Nations Online, uh, One World Nations Online explained it. And this means that the fourth world uh, it was coined in early 1970s by Shuswap chief uh, George Manuel, and it says that it refers to widely unknown nations or cultural entities of indigenous peoples. So this is first nations that are living within or across national state boundaries that are like invisible. So that's like, that's the, the fourth world. So economical definitions, economic definitions of first, second, and third world countries are the following. Uh, the term first world refers to so-called developed capitalist industrial countries, roughly a block of countries aligned with the United States after World War II with more or less common political economic interests, North America, Western Europe, Japan, and Australia. Countries of the first world, Graf uh, uh, on Prezi and uh, top 10 uh, countries that make the, the most money are there. You can see it. Like I'm using Prezi. Sorry, I didn't tell you, but that's uh, the program that I'm using. So you're going to see the graphs there. So the first um, top graph should explain uh, the G, uh, GDP or the amount of money that each country is making. And those are the top 10 uh, countries. Uh, now, the second world refers to the former communist socialist industrial states that were formerly the Eastern Bloc, the territory and sphere of influence of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. 
So today, Russia, Eastern Europe, for example, Poland, and some of the Turk states like Kazakhstan, as well as China. So these are the countries of the second world, as you can see there in that list. Of course, guys, please pause the video as much as you want. Uh, you don't have to like try to like keep up if I'm going too fast or if I'm going too slow. You could also uh, try to see if you can make it go faster. I am uh, hoping to upload this to YouTube, and I know that you can do that there. So feel free. Um, now, third world. Uh, are all the other countries, right? Today, often used to roughly describe the developing countries of Africa and of Asia and of Latin America. So the term third world includes, as well as capitalists and communists, uh, countries like Venezuela or North Korea, and also very rich countries like Saudi Arabia and very poor ones like Mali. Uh, third world countries classified by various in, in, indices, their political rights and civil liberties, the gross national income and poverty of countries, the human development of countries, and the freedom of information within a country. So what makes a nation third world? Uh, despite ever-evolving definitions, the concept of third world serves to identify countries that suffer from, like, for example, high infant mortality, low economic development, high levels of poverty, low use of natural resources, and heavy dependence on industrialized nations. And these are the presumed developing and technologically less advanced nations of Asia, Africa, Oceania, and Latin America. So third world nations tend to have economies dependent on developed countries and are generally characterized as poor, with unstable governments, having high rates of population growth, illiteracy, and disease. And so a key factor is the lack of a middle class uh, with impoverished millions in a vast lower economic class and a very small elite upper class controlling a country's wealth and resources. Uh, that's why there's been a lot of talks lately about whether or not the United States is a third world country. Um, most third world nations also have a very large foreign debt, which we also have. So man, this is like starting to sound like us here in the United States, it's a bit grim. Uh, yet Mexico is still imagined uh, to be the one country representative of the third world, you know, like the gateway country, you know, even though the economy is not so bad, you know, and they are assimilated into the political and uh, economic formats of capitalism. So how interesting, you know, so this is like a mystery, right? To talk about Mexico and U.S. relations, uh, I guess we could do it in two different ways, you know. One way is we could stop pretending that Mexico is a whole other separate country independent from the United States because the United States and Mexico are so tied together both culturally, politically, historically, economically that if Mexico fell, the U.S. would fall right with it and vice versa. So... In order to do this, uh, we're going to have to ignore, you know, to think that both countries are separate, we would have to ignore vital parts of history, the formation of this region we now call the United States of America, and not just history, we would also have to forget current policies and market relations. Uh, one example would be, you know, the supposed war on drugs, drug consumption and distribution, the control of the CIA over the drug trade and their overthrowing of powerful narcos or drug lords by uniting with other narco families and groups and then turning on them afterward as well. Uh, so the USA has also sided, you know, with revolutionary movements that were enemies of their enemies. So indirectly, they would prepare rebels with warfare and tactics within the school, for example, the School of the Americas, which was a sort of boot camp where people would be taught guerrilla tactics in order to sway history onto the U.S. outcome of, of choice, you know, what they wanted to happen. Uh, so many good leaders who were not fully into the idea of their nations being subordinate to the United States for way of doing life uh, by protecting their natural resources of the countries in question, uh, many of them were murdered by U.S. backed forces uh, to just get them out of the way. So in turn, many dictators were appointed within Latin American countries in this way. Dictators that were a, willing to sell out their countries to benefit the U.S. economy and political power uh, to grow. And a second way would be for us to go just ahead and start from way back from the beginning of the American continent by rescuing those parts of history that have been silenced, set aside, denied. And if you have noticed, there's a taboo hanging over any conversation or dialogue concerning Mexico and the United States. Uh, when we watch uh, 
and analyze U.S. mass media, we can see that Mexico stands for all that is dangerous, dirty, promiscuous, hypersexual, scatological, that means like poop oriented or like about shit, you know, stupid, uneducated, poor, unimportant in essence. All of that, which is the U.S. media, mass media imaginary that bases around the concept of all that is foreign, right? So what do all these concepts do? Well, they work together to dehumanize Mexicans and add this to the socioeconomic discrepancy between the countries. And we are led to conclude that Mexico is a failure and the United States as its complete opposite and counterpart is a success, right? So Mexico is like the whipping boy, you know, in the socioeconomic state that it is now actually because of the United States. And guess what? Immigration is not a Mexican problem. It does not originate from Mexico. It actually originates from U.S. greed and presence in the Mexican economy and in the whole entire Latin American economy, right? And this is why it is important to talk about Mexico, because even though it is our neighboring country, closer to us than Canada, by the way, most people do not know a thing about Mexico. They only know the lies that mainstream media throws at them. And we can take Mexico as a microscopic sample that emulates the political and economic relationship the U.S. has had with many other countries around the world. Then there is the social aspect of it all. Mexican, in simple terms, means really brown foreigner right? Because ask any Latinos. Uh, they live with most people around them assuming they're Mexican, even though they're not, right? Yes or no, right? Um, also, we have Middle Easterners, Eastern European friends that are confused with Mexicans, right? So then what happens? Uh, instead of blaming a society that re relies primordially and sometimes solely on being educated by media through this racialization of Latinos, right, and, 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 and turn, turn, turning everybody into Mexicans, uh, we also see a tendency of other Latinos and other people of color that resemble uh, Mexicans to hold resentment against Mexicans, right? When Mexicans are the poster child of immigration and Latinidad, so what usually follows if you go, hey, you're Mexican, there's firm denials, you know, and that are not simply lines of, no, I'm not Mexican, you know, I am whatever, you know, but it's more like they're like, ew, I'm not Mexican, like I'm a low, I'm not a lowly Mexican, I'm Brazilian, you know, and it's like that, that, that thing that you're listening to there between the lines, that's the logic of coloniality that I will be introducing to you next week when we start talking about what's going on in the brain and the back end of all this, like, kind of interactions that we have every day and everyday life, right? Uh, another example of this uh, logic of coloniality or hierarchization of identities is when Chicanos uh, say that people who still, still speak Spanish are below them or like they're paisas, you know, like they're like less than them, or also Latinos or, who, or uh, Mexicanos who look at Chicanos and go, you don't speak Spanish, How, you're not a real Mexican, right? Or, or Latinos who tell other Latinos that they cannot be Latino uh, because they don't speak Spanish, so not just Mexicans, right? So if you are Latino, there's another question. Why are you so white? You don't look Latino, right? Or why? Or if you're black, you can't be Latino. Or if you're Asian, you can't be Latino. And all these divisions of identity, that's racialization. That's what that means. Uh, racialization is kind of like when you expect a certain group of people to have the same physical attributes and the same color skin and the same like nose or profile or whatever. And that's uh, very racist, right? Uh, because that's not how the world works. That's just like a way that we are forcing onto the world. Uh, so anyway, uh, just because you were able, for example, oh, that another one, like when there's people who think, oh, I'm Chicano and I made it in the United States. It's just that you guys are lazy, right? Get it together, you know? And just because you were able to move forward in this pyramid society, it doesn't mean that it is possible for everyone to do that. And it's kind of rem reminiscent of Dave Chappelle's skit. I don't know if you've ever, are you familiar with Dave Chappelle where he talks about uh, Oscar the Grouch and then he says that all the kids are like mad and they're like, get it together, Grouch. Like telling, you know, uh, uh, Oscar the Grouch and then he's like, like, bitch, I live in a trash can. You know, like, it's like, you guys are so separated from reality. And you're not even acknowledging the fact that I live in a freaking trash can. Like, how am I going to uh, compete when there's no such thing as the same reality that you have, I don't have, right? Uh, so someone has helped you to get where you are. Someone has to help you in some way or another. 
And you, if you say nobody helped you, then maybe you're just a person that has really bad memory.